Anybody's stomach drop as you got to the top of that rickety climb on that clanking roller coaster? My, my bias is already coming through, but seriously, we were just watching it on a video. We weren't even on the ride, but the anticipation, the, the anxiety, they got to the edge, and then what's coming next, the, the drop. But how, how high were they? How fast were they going to fall? Was this a, a, a free fall? And then what, what's coming next? I don't know if I cut it off in time, but there was a tunnel. They were going to go through a dark tunnel after that. And what, what's going to come after that? The twists and the turns, the dips and the dives, the corkscrews, the, the inversions, the, the inclines, you know, the back and forth and the up and down. They're going to go slow and they're going to speed up. Who, who best personifies you on, on those kind of rides, those roller coasters? Is it this lady? She seems genuinely excited to be on the roller coaster, a thrill seeker, the adrenaline rush, the arms like JR are up in the air, her mouth is wide, she's, she's laughing, she's smiling, maybe screaming in, in joy. She, she would ride this again and again and again, loop after loop, she, she wouldn't even want to get off. Is that you when it comes to roller coasters or are you more like this gal? <laughs> she does not want to be on that ride at all, does she? Her eyes are closed, her arms are tense. If you could see her knuckles, they would be bright white, wouldn't they? She's like, get me off this ride. I don't want to be here any longer. I don't know how long she can hold her breath, but I'm guessing she's been holding her breath the entire ride. She just wants that ride to end, and when, when it does end and she gets off that ride, she's going to find the person who talked her into going on that ride and have a word or two, if not more, with her about that. Um, there's only one smart person on this ride, and he's sitting in the front row, and he's on the right side. He's the one holding the lap bar. Not only does he have his hands and arms inside the ride at all times, he's actually holding on to that bar in front of him. I, I told you that uh, maybe you picked up on it. I'm not much for roller coasters. I don't care for them all that much, the dips and the, and the drops and the twists and the turns and the corkscrews and the, the inversions, the, the heights and the speed. It's, it's just not for me. I just don't want to spend the rest of the day feeling queasy, queasy or, or woozy. I, I just don't want my head to be pounding and my neck to ache for the next couple of hours. But back when I was a cool dad, back when I was younger, back when my kids were younger, I'd actually take them on those uh, roller coasters, but you, you better believe it that my hands were not up in the air. They were firmly holding onto that bar in front of me and my eyes were closed and I was probably the one holding my, my breath. It, it's interesting, we're talking about prayer right now in confirmation class, morning confirmation class, afternoon, Wednesday afternoon confirmation class. And we just talked about the ennies of prayer, that we can pray anytime, anywhere, any place. We can use any words. We can pray about anything. How about on a roller coaster? How about praying on a roller coaster? Coaster. How about rather than folding your hands, you have your hands grasping onto that lap bar in front of you. How about the duration of the ride? How about any words? How about words like this? Lord, help. <laughs> Lord, keep me safe. Protect me. Lord, get me off this thing. Lord, let this ride end. And it would. It did eventually end the ride. Most of those roller coaster rides are two, maybe three minutes top. Some of them are even shorter than that. And then it's all done, except for the walk of shame, of course. Because you always have to go to that booth or that, that uh, table where they take the pictures, you know, of the tallest drop, and they get everyone's picture coming down that, and then we'd have to show it to the kids, and they could laugh and make fun. But I didn't put one of those on the screen, just that other, yeah. But roller coasters, huh? Roller coasters. The roller coaster of life. The roller coaster of emotion. The spiritual roller coaster that we find ourselves on at times. It's no amusement ride, is it? It has its anxious heights. It's death-defying drops, gut-wrenching turns, heart-stopping twists, and those inversions and those corkscrews that can disorient us and never know which end is up. But you know, as we go through life, as we go on that roller coaster of life, as God's children, we don't have to be terrified. Don't be terrified as you go through life, as you ride that roller coaster of emotion. Just hold on. Just hold on by faith. Hold on to God. Hold on to his promises. 
God's Old Testament prophet Jeremiah found himself on one of those spiritual roller coasters, an emotional roller coaster in life and, and in his ministry. He had those gut-wrenching turns and those heart-stopping twists and those, those corkscrews that left him spiritually disoriented, those loops that never seemed to end and he didn't know which end was, was up. He shared a little insight what it's like to be on that ride as we read from Jeremiah 15 just a few moments ago. See, God had called him to be his spokesperson to his Old Testament people. He had called him to proclaim a message, a very specific message, a not very popular message. He wasn't out there telling the people what they wanted to hear, just the opposite. He told them what they needed to hear. It was a message of repentance. Knock it off was his me message. Stop it. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop living how you're living or else. An enemy king is coming and a, a, a powerful army is coming. Destruction is coming. Devastation is coming. Death is coming. Deportation is coming if you guys don't knock it off. Well, needless to say, Jeremiah wasn't packing the house on Sunday morning. He wasn't filling the pews. The people weren't rushing out to hear him. They didn't want anything to do with him. They didn't want to see him. They didn't want to listen to him. They avoided him. More than that, they resented him. They hated him. They made fun of him. They ridiculed him. They persecuted him. He even spent time in prison. He was even beaten, Jeremiah, the prophet. Imagine how that would go over. Imagine how that would feel. Jeremiah began to question himself. He began to doubt himself. He began these pity parties for himself. More than that, Jeremiah began to question God. Jeremiah began to doubt God. Jeremiah began to complain to God. More than that, if it could get worse. More than that, he actually began to blame God for everything bad, everything wrong that was going wrong in his life and in his ministry. More than that, Jeremiah began to accuse God, accuse God of being mean and manipulative and deceitful. Where are you, God, in my life, Jeremiah's point was. You're supposed to be this great God of power. Well, I don't see any power. It'd be nice to see your power. You tell me you have it. I, you're supposed to be this God of love, God. I don't see any love. Show it to me sooner rather than later, please. You ever been on that ride? You ever sat in that seat? Those abusive corkscrews that just leave you spiritually disoriented. Those loops, those inversions where you just, they don't end, they just go on and on. You don't know what way is up anymore. Those heart-wrenching twists, those gut gut-wrenching drops, the anxiety of the height, the fear of the, of the drop been on that right set in that seat where, where are you god You're supposed to be a god of power i don't see your power not in my life not in the world you're god of love are you kidding me god i don't see your love in the world i don't see your love in my life lord honestly how how much more can our our country take how many more hits how many more natural disasters, the hurricanes and the, and the floods in the south and the droughts and the fires out west, the maker of heaven and earth, and you can't do anything about that stuff, God? Lord, our country has never been more polarized, left and right, conservative and liberal, Democrat, Republican, white and black, the tension, the social tension, the racial tension, the political tension in our country, the violence. Everybody's talking, but nobody's listening. The economy's falling apart and businesses are being burdened. People are stealing and looting. And you're supposed to be the Prince of Peace, God? You're not going to do anything about this? You know the list could go on, right? My marriage is spiraling out of control. My finances are in a free fall. My, my health is an uphill climb. We've got to blame somebody, don't we? How about the God who promised to never slumber or sleep because he seems to be on an extended vacation right now? Jeremiah put it this way. He said, why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? Will you be to me like a deceptive brook? Like a spring that fails? Who's questioning God now? 
Who's doubting God now? Is it still Jeremiah? Or might it be you? Might it, might it be me in this life? Who, who's blaming God for all the bad stuff that's happening in our life or in our world? Who's accusing God of being mean and manipulative and deceitful? Your promises seem a little empty, Lord. Your word seems a little worthless. Ever been on that ride? Ever sit in that seat? If we think we have it bad, and if Jeremiah thought he had it bad, have you ever thought about Jesus? The one who, as Isaiah tells us, was one who was despised and rejected by men? A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering? The men the one from whom men hid their faces? And for what? For just doing what God the Father told them to do? I, what did Jesus ever do wrong? He was just out there speaking the truth in love, wasn't he? He was just out there pointing out sin, bringing guilt to light, exposing hypocrisy, con condemning self-righteousness, work righteousness. Why did the people hate him? Why did the people hate him so much, the one who, who, who loved them even more? Why did they want him dead? Why did they want to kill him so badly, the one who simply desperately wanted to just give them life? It doesn't make any sense. But that's what they did. They just stopped following him, didn't they? They left him. They abandoned him. They didn't want anything to do with him. They didn't listen to him, the crowds. Of course, who fills the vacuum? Who fills that void? Those religious leaders were right there, weren't they? The plotting, the scheming, the planning. They were going to trip him up. They were going to trap him. They were going to trick him. They, they want to humiliate him. They want to confuse him. They want to discredit him with all those questions. Finally, they just had him arrested, right? Falsely accuse him on trial. Condemn him to death. Jesus' reaction to all that? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and yet he did not open his mouth, Isaiah tells us. Peter says when they hurled their insults at him, he remained silent. Rather, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Never once did Jesus doubt God's justice. Never once did Jesus question his Father's plan for him or for the world. Rather, he said, not my will but yours be done. Never once did Jesus blame his Father for the hell, the literal hell that he went through on the cross. Rather, Jesus just held on. Didn't he? He held on to that cross until every necessary drop of his precious blood had been shed to wash away your sin and mine and the sin of the whole world. He just held on to the promise of his father that he would not abandon him to the grave or allow his body to see decay. So he could pray with his last dying breath, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Peter tells us he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Hold on to that, dear Christian. Hold on to God and to his promises. God saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Hold on to that. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ Jesus, not counting our sins against us. Hold on to that. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all unrighteousness. Hold on to that. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He who believes in him will live even though he dies. Hold on to that. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Hold on to that. I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Hold on to that. 
Or like he told Jeremiah, he now tells us, I'm going to make you a fortified wall, a wall of bronze, so that when your oppressors attack you, you will not fall. They will not overpower you. Hold on to that. Promise of our almighty God to say, I will rescue you and I will save you from your enemies. Hold on to that. This roller coaster of life has its lows and its depths and its drops and its twists and its turns, usually filled with our own doubt and worry and fear. This roller coaster of life also has its highs and it has its sweet spots and its smooth spots.